The focus on this section will be to do with some of the statistics around sexual health. Back in 2012, the then Health Protection Agency came out with this particular statement saying that the predominant transmission mode of both HIV and other STIs is sexual intercourse. In addition, strong evidence supports several biological mechanisms through which STIs facilitate HIV transmission by, by increasing both HIV infectiousness and HIV susceptibility. Methods for preventing sexual transmission of HIV and sexual infections are the same, as are the target audiences for the interventions. So if we stop and unpick that for a moment, so if we stop and unpick that for, for a moment, the basic message is don't have condomless sex. Okay? Now that's the in word at the moment, condomless sex. Because it um, it used to be referred to as unprotected sex, but again there are a couple of problems with that. On the one hand, if you ask a person, especially say for example a heterosexual woman, if you ask her has she had protected sex or unprotected sex, she's more likely to say that she's had protected sex if, for example, she's using contraception such as the pill. Because in her mind, the sex is protected because she's actually taking something to prevent her having an unplanned um, or unwanted conception. So she can say, yes, I'm having protected sex. But in relation to sexual infections and HIV, then it's not just contraception that, that's needed, but safer sex in the wider context, meaning condoms to be used to protect against infection. When a lot of young people to, um, today have heard of um, the chlamydia campaigns, various campaigns to help them reduce their risk of acquiring or transmitting chlamydia, then if they're using condoms to protect against chlamydia, then those condoms will also protect them against HIV as well, and um, so many of the other sexual infections. So it's better to talk about condomless sex rather than unprotected. And the final reason I'd like to share with you for that is because when we talk about unprotected sex, there can be some moral blame um, included in that. Say, for example, if somebody develops lung cancer, you watch the way that so many people will ask the very first question as, oh, do you smoke? As if they say, well, the minute the person says, yes, I smoke, they'll say, well, you knew the risks, the decision is yours. And that was a slogan used in an HIV campaign on UK televisions a few years ago. So we have to be aware of moralist implications of blame. So rather than saying um, protected or unprotected sex, it's better to talk about condomless sex. Okay? Back in the year 2000 and 2001, um, first Wales, then England and Scotland produced their own sexual health strategies. Um, that seems a long, long time ago now. So here in England, back in 2013, a framework for sexual health improvement was um, uh, published by the Department of, uh, Department of Health. And you can see on the slide here that it shows quite a number of key targets which this framework um, tried to achieve. First of all, a number in unwanted pregnancies. Again, there's always um, nuances with words. So there's a difference between an unwanted pregnancy and an unplanned pregnancy. And maybe that's something you want to think about. Um, what's the difference between those two terms and what are the implications of using one or the other? Also, greater efforts to prevent the sharing or passing of sexual infections. You'll notice here that I've put SAIs in brackets because STI is the internationally accepted term, sexually transmitted infections. But if you change the focus and talk about sexually acquired infections, then lots of people will ask you what you actually mean by that. Because when you talk about sexually transmitted, again, there's some element of blame implied in this. That person gave it to me. They transmitted it to me. There's the blame involved. Whereas if you talk about sexually acquired, that means, oh, how did I get it? So if I don't want to get a sexual infection, 
Um, or if I was a woman and I didn't want an unplanned uh, conception, then I need to look after myself. So for the, for the many people that can protect themselves, say for example by practicing safer sex and using condoms, then it makes more um, it, 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 it makes better sense to talk about sexually acquired infections because in that case both parties, if there are two parties involved in the sex, both parties should be protecting themselves and by protecting themselves they're also protecting the other. So sexually acquired infections is probably a preferred term to use although the internationally recognized one is still STI. Um, another um, uh, bullet point on here is an increase in the number of people in high-risk groups being tested for HIV. I'm so sorry that in 2013 the Department of Health still wanted to use this terminology because it's very evocative of the early days of HIV where people were seen to be in high-risk groups and there's so many problems with that that we haven't got time to go into at the moment. But one of the key problems is that if people think it's belonging to a particular group that makes a person at additional risk, then on the other hand, that's letting off everybody that doesn't identify with being in that group. So in the early days of HIV, when it was predominantly gay, bisexual and other males having sex with males, and then increasingly seeing people around the world, especially of different ethnicities from different parts of the world, um, it, it led to a blame game of people in certain groups, but it doesn't matter what group you're in so much as what activities you are doing. So whether the activities you're doing are putting you at personal risk of sexual infections, including HIV, not so much the group you're in. Um, building an honest and open culture where everyone is able to make informed and responsible choices about relationships and sex. That sounds wonderful um, on so many levels and yet how many people are not able to make informed and responsible choices about relationships and sex. Maybe even when you look at young people in schools, if they're not getting sufficient sexual health education, relationships and sex education, sex and relationship education, whatever you want to call it, if they're not getting enough of this, then how are they meant to make informed and responsible choices about their relationships and sex education? So a lot of this will take us to the, the origins of where's the information coming from, how accurate is it? And if schools aren't providing this, for each and every other person. So that's another problem um, inherent in this. When you have particular schools, maybe faith schools, that will absent their students from certain aspects of teaching, or maybe even parents withdraw their young people. Those young people meant to grow up in our society to make informed and responsible when they don't know uh, um, the, the, the issues facing them in regards to the safety or risks that they may be posing. The next bullet point that talks about so that all people have rapid and easy access to appropriate sexual health services. This may sound rather political of me to say this, but this is article. With the cutbacks in uh, spending on any Services in particular, um, especially across England, this has had a disproportionate impact on and contraceptive services. It's often been discussed and reported in a group I belong to called the All Party Parliamentary Group um, for Sexual and Reproductive Health that meets in the House of Lords. We're often having debates about this. On the one hand, the government wants to improve the health of the nation. On the other hand, slashing um, uh, resources is not the way to go about this. That's me being political. Offering counselling to all women who request an abortion so they can discuss the options and choices available with a trained counsellor. This is another hot potato that, uh, that, that will have both sides of an argument here on how much uh, uh, an input counselling needs to be made here so that people can have an informed uh, choice. The head of Health Protection Agency once said that the best way to prevent all sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, is to 
practice safer sex. This means using a condom with all new sexual partners until you have both been tested in the all clear. In fact, back in uh, 2005, I actually wrote an, arg um, an article on this uh, titled Clever Dicks Do It in a Condom. Maybe it's a time I update this message now, but it's still as new today as it was back then. When it comes to for statistics on sexual infections, especially here in England, there is a very good website owned by uh, Public Health England. If you just Google uh, a term like sexual health profiles or sexual health fitness, PHE, then you'll find it or just go straight to the web address showing on this page at the moment. With profile that you're looking at there, there are so many different tabs that you can click. So if you're interested in sexual infections, um, teenage pregnancies, HIV statistics, you can click on each of these, but then you can make some comparisons, for example, between your own town or borough and compare it to the next town or borough, compare it to London as the capital city or England as a whole. So you'll see from the one page that there are different ways in which you can check the levels of infection rates or unplanned exceptions or abortions within your own particular area. And another good website for you to check out is the Office for National Statistics, ons.uk. And a few years ago they came out with this particular statement that, that was relevant then, just a few years ago, as it is now today. So, due to concerted effort from 1999 until about 2010, there was a concerted effort with a department in the Department of Education called the Teenage Pregnancy Unit. And lots of money was put into this, and lots of resources. And what we saw was a gradual downward trend of teenage and unplanned conception. And that trend has carried on at the moment. I mentioned um, a few slides that there have been some major cutbacks in various types of health services. If these cutbacks are going to continue, uh, then I reckon it's only a matter of time before we see an increase in so many of these uh, statistics again. But what the ONS was saying was, some of the key findings, is that now in England we have the lowest net level of teenage conceptions since 1969. That's quite, um, quite a few achieved indeed. Um, also, the number of conceptions for women aged under 18 has fallen and for those under 16. Whereas conception rates are raise, uh, rising for those over 30 years old. And that shows choices that people often make in life, especially for when they want to start a family or start having children, many women in particular now are leaving it until they are a little bit older. That in itself brings uh, lots of questions that we could address and uh, uh, answers to as well. And in March of 2020, Alison Hadley, who's got a hugely famous name in teenage pregnancy care and was awarded an honorary doctorate at the University of Greenwich, in 2018, um, Alison still regularly puts out bulletins from where she's working at the moment, the Teenage Pregnancy Knowledge Exchange at the University of Bedford. And in March 2020, she said that as, at a national level, the downward trend in under 18 conception rate continues with a 6.2 reduction from 2017, bringing the overall decline from 1998 to 64%. And it was in 1999 that the, what was called the Teenage Pregnancy the Teenage Pregnancy Strategy was first published. So it was from that date onwards when we reached such a high time in the UK for teenage and unplanned conditions that that's when things started to change. Here I'm going to show you a few slides which um, give us some statistics, but it actually taps into the whole notion of us asking questions, being critical about the statistics we find. Look at this one here from the Office of National Statistics talking about the percentage of girls under 16 and under 18 being uh, pregnant, looking at the actual figures or public perception. And again, if you just look at the whole topic of perceptions or teenage pregnancies and look across different newspapers, especially some of the daily ones, ways in which they report the same story. 
So it's well worth when you hear anything about statistics, like that old saying, is your glass half full or half empty? It's always worth questioning statistics. Who actually um, designed the statistics? Who's gathered the data for them? Um, who's actually now reporting on them? So it makes it makes sensible to try to look behind the original figures. This one from a very famous sexual health clinic in London called 56 Dean Street. Look at the ways in which HIV diagnoses has dropped over these past few years. And in their clinic alone, they saw an 80% decrease um, in new HIV diagnoses in um, 2017. And that was due to the introduction of pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, PrEP, which is something I would have covered on my Spark page on HIV Foundations, or if I've given that session in you, it's that original session. A really good infographic that you can easily access from Public Health England. Here's one now from uh, 2020, but that Changes. They keep bringing new ones out, so please go to Public Health England and check out for the infographic on sexual infections in England. I want to show you two particular slides showing sexual infections over a number of key, uh, um, key years. You'll see here on this particular slide and on the that genital warts are actually decreasing, and a lot of that is in relation to HPV, HPV vaccination. So HPV vaccination was brought in a few years ago. There are two types. One that gets rid of two types of wart virus, that's called a bivalent vaccine, and one that get rid, gets rid of four, that's a quadrivalent. Now, the first round of vaccinations for girls in school, when that was first brought in, um, the, uh, the department was paying for the bivalent one. So there are four different types of viruses that can cause genital warts. And two out of those four can lead to cervical cancer uh, later in life. So that's the vaccine that was first being used. Then the department changed its provider and went for the quadrivalent one. So that's also decreased the number of genital warts. So as time passes now, hopefully to see uh, um, much bigger drops in numbers of people both with cancer and with genital warts. So you can see that one's decreasing. But just have a look at the statistics on herpes and gonorrhea. Those, um, one, a viral infection, herpes, and gonorrhea, a bacterial infection, both of those increasing in females at the moment. And Concern in the last couple of years to do with gonorrhea is that in some parts of the country there has been a rise in multi drug resistant gonorrhea, and that's very, very problematic because once the first line of antibiotic treatment is given, if that doesn't work, there's a backup second, uh, second approach. But if that fails, then there's nothing left to be treating. So, really, prevention is going to be much safer than trying to go for any form of cure. And as um, herpes is a virus, of course, there's no antibiotic, there's no cure for herpes, although it can be maintained um, with antiretroviral medications. When you look at this uh, showing the statistics for males, you can see in particular that um, gonorrhea and syphilis are on a serious incline. Okay, they're all going upward at the moment. If you break down the group of males, some of the gonorrhea and syphilis statistics are particularly higher in sexual and other males having sex with males. So the population within males where there is this um, upward trend indeed. Okay, so it keeps going back to the message all the time around sexual health prevention, talking of safer sex, using and there's been a particular rise in this, since, as some would argue, since the, um, uh, the introduction of pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV. Because some men now use PrEP are thinking if they're on PrEP to prevent them against getting HIV, they need to use condoms. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, and condoms are still needed to protect 
to all other sexual infections as well. And in the foundation session I do on HIV, um, I'm coming out with a particular slogan all the time that was quite popular years ago saying that there is still no cure for AIDS and there is still no vaccine against HIV. Medications being used at the moment, once a person has been diagnosed with HIV, the medications mean that the person's viral load can be put down to such low levels that it becomes undetectable. And once it's undetectable, it's then impossible for them to, uh, to pass HIV through condomless sex. Okay. Um, again, if you look at these statistics, um, and a really good check out for these in the UK is avert.org. And you'll see that they use statistics from UN AIDS and from Public Health England. So you can trust these that these are the most reliable and up to date. So in the UK, we have oh, um, have over 100,000 people living with HIV at the moment. And although many of them that's being um, uh, treated and therefore they're now becoming unacceptable uh, it still means that a hundred, over a hundred thousand is the highest number of people we've ever had living with HIV in the UK and for people who don't get tested for HIV and therefore they do not know their status they're the ones at risk of passing on the infection to other people and if you've seen my HIV foundation session, you'll know that the 1990, and now there's another 90, a part of UN AIDS campaign. Um, first of all, to get all those people living with HIV, to get 90% of them uh, tested as soon as possible. And then to get 90% of those testing pos uh, positive, started on antiretroviral medication as quickly as possible. And thirdly, that all those on antiretroviral medication manage to achieve an undetectable viral load as rapidly as possible. Okay, if all of that happens, then HIV is going to gradually fizzle out of our world. A target was 2030, but you'll know from my HIV Foundation session that certain countries around the world are nowhere near achieving these 90-90-90 goals. And the final 90 that UNAIDS brought in um, in 2019 was to try to put stigma around HIV by at least 90% as well. And here's the slogan for you equals you. If you're on Twitter, you'd have to hashtag in and write the word equals because the equal sign doesn't translate uh, with hashtags in Twitter. So you equals you stands for undetectable equals uninfectious. And when I first started teaching HIV studies back in 1990, we couldn't have even dreamed of words like this. So uh, I know it's taken decades for us to get here, but this is really the best situation that we've ever been in, in relation to HIV studies to date. And if it's documentation you're looking for in relation to sexual health and HIV, there are so many. Some produced by the government, by the Department of Health, on all aspects of sexual health, including HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, um, all different sections. So if it's strategies you're looking for or policy documents, have a look at the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, but also lots of the medical and nursing colleges and uh, um, other professional bodies, such as the Faculty for Sexual and Reproductive Health, the British Association for Sexual Health and HIV, uh, HIV Association, so many others have all produced their own professional guidelines. As well. So when you are looking for nursing, medical and other health care uh, doctors, start off with the Department for Health and Social Care and also check out uh, the main sexual health professional organisations. For any of you caring for young people or anyone with impeded capacity for making decisions, then it's really well worth you becoming familiar with the Fraser Guidelines. Some people may refer to these as Gillett Competence, but the technical term is the Fraser Guidelines. These were actually promulgated by Justice Fraser, and you can find them on the um, NSPCC or a whole host of other organisations, including Brooke. Okay, so when Lord Justice Fraser was 
produced these guidelines, it was in relation to a case uh, brought against GP and the health authority by a woman called Victoria Gillick. What had happened was that with the age of for sex being 16, um, her 15 year old daughter had gone to the GP and said that she was in a relationship with a boy. They wanted to start sex, but she didn't want to become pregnant. So she asked the GP for contraception. The GP checked out that she fully understood what she was asking for, that she understood the consent and that she was going to go off and have uh, sex anyway, whether the GP had given the contraception or not. The GP thought it was in the girl's best interest to give her contraception. Her mother really disagreed with this and therefore took the GP and the authority to court. And it went all the way to the High Court where Lord Justice Fraser had to rule on it. And this is what he said. And although the term here is referring to doctors, any healthcare professional who has the ability to prescribe contraception. So a doctor could proceed advice and treatment provided that he is satisfied, satisfied with the following criteria. First of all, that the person, um, although under the age of 16 or with limited capacity to make a decision for themselves, will understand the the healthcare professional's uh, specific advice. That they cannot persuade the individual to inform their parent or parents or to allow the, the professional to inform them on the young person's behalf. Okay? But, um, there's a great chance the young person's going to go off and continue with having sex or start having sex um, in the first place with or without the contraception. And um, if the person did have condomless sex and unprotected contraceptive point of view, that it would be worse on their health than were they have the contraception. Then it's in the best interest to give contraception, okay, um, with uh, without parental consent. Now, once that was written in relation to contraception, many young people are now applying this in relation even making decisions about surgical or other medical interventions that they do in their lives, even though they may be under a specific age. Okay, and thanks for listening to this section.